All right, we are starting. Welcome everyone to another tutorial at uh, LCA Linux Conference Australia, Sydney 2018. We are here today with uh, Florian Haas. Uh, Florian is an expert in uh, distributed storage, high availability performance, and open source cloud. Uh, earlier in the conference, uh, Florian also gave a talk on uh, Open EDX, uh, which is a platform. Uh, well, you could check that out. Uh, check that out. He's also a founder of what is the company? Like, well, the the company I founded was yeah. called Stexo, and uh, that has been acquired as of uh, last October. So I'm now part of City Network. Yeah. So that company is also uh, using Open. Uh, OpenStack, OpenEdX, Ceph, yeah, Lexi, everything. everything. And today we're here to hear all about LXC. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Let me turn this off mm -hmm. as well. OK, thank you for that. Um, on this day specifically, um, I would like to offer my individual acknowledgment of the Gadigal of the Eora Nation who are the traditional custodians of this land and offer my respects to the elders both past and present. Um, I would also like to acknowledge uh, Linux Australia, the custodians of LCA, if you will, and pay my respects to all the conference organizers and volunteers past and present who um, year after year managed to put together a truly one-of-a-kind conference that I and many others love coming back to. And you're all a part of that community and I would like to thank you for that privilege as well. My name is Florian. I work for City Network. As my shirt implies, we love OpenStack. We run a public OpenStack cloud that spans um, eight global regions. We run a bunch of private and managed clouds. And that's what I mostly talk about at conferences, um, including my talk from earlier this week at the Open Education Miniconf that also touched upon OpenStack. Um, and as it happens, we use LXC, the topic of this talk, quite a lot in our OpenStack deployments. But what I'm talking about here in this tutorial is a completely different use case, and that is containers on the desktop. And uh, that it basically it, it dovetails really nicely with, uh, with a keynote from, from Jesse earlier this morning. Um, all the things that she said about, you know, this is crazy to do, running Skype containerized on the desktop, that's not crazy at all. I, I do that all the time. I think that's perfect. Um, so those are some of the things that, um, that we're going to cover here. Uh, question for the AV folks, are we okay with the feedback here? Because I do hear a little bit of a noise. You're working that out. Okay, cool. All right. So, um, so with that said, I do want to point out something straight off the bat, which is I do want to mention that nothing that I talk about here in this tutorial is the only way. There are several ways to run a containerized desktop you will notice that uh, the, the method that, that I present here, for example, is wildly different from the one that Jesse, Jesse described in the keynote this morning. Um, I just found the one that I'm describing here to be useful for me, and I hope it's useful for you as well. I've been using it on a daily basis, the setup that I'm describing here, um, for something like, I don't know, a year and a half or two years now. Um, in fact, the slides that you're looking at um, come out of a containerized web server uh, that's running on my laptop right now. So um, this is just presented to you in the hope that it's useful to you, but with uh, absolutely uh, no angle of this is the only way that you can do this. Um, and um, I encourage you to do your own experimentation and uh, perhaps come up with a way that suits you better. So with that said, What's a container? For those of you who sat in the keynote this morning, this should actually be no news to you. Um, from the perspective of the Linux kernel, right? Like in terms of a kernel object, what is a container in terms of like in the context of being a kernel object? Anyone want to have a go? What's that? Well, hang on. Like from the kernel standpoint, what's a container? Trick question. From the kernel standpoint, a container doesn't exist. 
right? From the kernel standpoint, there is no such thing as a kernel level object that we could call a container. Containers are purely a user space concept um, that make use and make it easy, make use of and make it easy to use a bunch of native Linux kernel features. So the thing that we call a container to the Linux kernel is really nothing but a process, a process using one or more namespaces and making use of C groups. And optionally, it could also use a Linux security module like um, SE Linux or AppArmor or any other. But from the perspective of the kernel, a container is really nothing special. It's just a process that happens to be using a handful of advanced kernel features. And because those kernel features are relatively advanced and a little bit arcane, it's really nice to be able to have a, what we call a container runtime, which is basically a management facility that makes using all of these kernel level interfaces a little easier. And as you've heard in the keynote this morning, there are multiple such container runtimes available. I'm gonna be talking about Lexi, like there is another one, um, that Docker, there's Rocket, there's a few others, right? And um, just so you know, no, I'm not going to revisit the container wars at all. Um, I am going to explain to you why I chose Lexi for what I'm doing here. Um, and I'm suggesting that you might want to consider that as well, but it's definitely not the only container runtime um, that is out there. Um, as far as namespaces are concerned, a, um, a, a concept that isn't really novel in the kernel anymore, although we keep adding namespaces all the time. So while the concept of namespaces is not exactly new anymore, I think it's about 10-ish years old at this point, um, we, we always, we, well not always, but we occasionally start, keep adding uh, namespace concepts to the kernel. Um, the first one was the mount namespace, so that's basically, you know, Chiroot on steroids. Uh, we added, we subsequently added a uh, user namespace, so, um, the, so that a, a, something that runs in this namespace can have its own set of UIDs and GIDs. Uh, we added a, an IPC namespace um, so that we can isolate how individual processes talk to each other over um, inter-process communications like SHM. We have network, whoops, you just killed me here. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. That's all right. We can, this is the, this is the nice thing about having sort of the, Tutorial, we're not quite pressed on time, not, not as badly as in a regular talk. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. good, perfect. Um, uh, network namespace is pretty important, so that's basically a means of uh, giving an individual process its, uh, its own IP addresses, but also its own uh, firewall rules, connection tracking table, NAT rules, and so on. And we have a handful of other namespaces. And then we can use cgroups in order to give processes, in this case containers, um, specific, shall we say, restrictions on resource usage, right? So, but like I said, what's important to understand, what's important to take away here is that from the, from the purpose, from the uh, perspective of the Linux kernel, a container as such doesn't really exist. Um, it's just a process that uses a handful of pretty handy kernel features. Now with that said, we have to make a very important distinction. And that is along the lines of what the kind of process is that the container runtime actually launches. And here we, the, based on that, we distinguish between system versus application containers. Raise your hand if, you, if you've heard of this distinction before. System and application containers. A few, okay, cool. Um, the difference between those is really what is the process that the container runtime starts for us. If that process is something that would uh, normally be, an, be considered an init process, so conventionally that's system D, but it could also be upstart, it could be system five init, it could be openRC, whichever. If that's what it is that the container runtime starts for us, then we're talking about a system container. So basically this thing works just like, you know, your regular server or workstation or desktop or laptop in that you have a process that manages all other processes and sets up things like, for example, network connectivity by spawning a DHCP client and a handful of other things. So basically the moment that your container runtime starts and in it, we're talking about a system container. 
The moment your container runtime starts something completely different, such as, for example, um, your Docker runtime starting an Apache binary, that's when we talk about an application container. And in an application container, obviously, it is a requirement that everything that the application needs in order to, for example, be able to access disks and talk over the network, et cetera, et cetera, all of that then has to be set up by the container runtime. With a system container, the container runtime doesn't need to care about that that much because there's an init that does this, and in an application container, the container runtime needs to do that. Lexi is an, ex is an example of a container runtime that is primarily built for system containers, and that is how we're going to use it. It is primarily built for system containers, which means that yes, you still can run application containers in them, it's just not something that people do very often. For other container runtimes like Docker and Rocket, the opposite is true. Those are primarily built for application containers, and if you bend over backwards a little bit, you can also use those for system containers. But basically, normally, if you are selecting your container runtime based on what you're trying to do with it, then if you wanted to use system containers, you would typically select like C. If you wanted to build application containers, you would use another container runtime like um, Docker or Rocket. By the way, I neglected to mention something very important when I first started this talk. This is a tutorial, so please feel invited to shoot out your questions anytime. Right? This, I, go ahead. Oh, what is LSM? LSM are Linux security modules, and um, these are this is basically the the uh, the, the security enforcement framework that um, the kernel provides and that user space applications can then use. Examples for these, the two most popular ones are SE Linux, that's quite popular sort of on the um, Red Hat and CentOS and Fedora side of the universe, and um, the other one which is very very popular is App Armor, uh, and what those do is um, they constrain certain processes such that uh, they're only allowed to access specific resources such as specific files uh, or specific device nodes and so forth in, um, in a file system. That's primarily what they do. They do a bunch of other things as well, but that's sort of the, the primary use case. So that's, that's what an LSM stands for, a Linux security module. Okay. Back to the, to the distinction of like uh, various container types. So we've had system versus application containers, and, and a few of you had heard about that distinction before. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard uh, the, between, the, the distinction between privileged and unprivileged containers. Okay, that's a few more. Great, because that was mentioned in the keynote this morning. Um, so what's privileged versus unprivileged containers? A privileged container is, is, a, is a container, so Recall, that's just a process that runs in a few namespaces that happens to run in the context of root in the host. Okay, so we've got something that actually runs as root in the host with all the security implications that comes with that. Unprivileged containers run as a regular non-root user in the host, um, including just your regular old user account. Now, uh, that is a little bit more complex. It's also more secure. Because uh, what an unprivileged container does is uh, what we call uh, UID and Git mapping. So the way that works is you have a certain UID on your host system. Um, in my case, that's 1000. And uh, the, the container, the Lexi container that I spin up as my user or under the context of my user, even though it is completely unprivileged in the host, pretends to be root within the container, okay? And the way that what that works is that basically we are mapping UIDs and GIDs from within the container to those in the host, and the way that is conventionally done is by basically shifting the UIDs and GIDs by 100,000, okay? So we're, we're, we're spinning up, uh, we're allowing the user to create a bunch of um, sub UIDs and sub GIDs as they're called, and they start with, uh, with 100,000. That maps to root in the container, so UID zero in the container. And then everything else, we just add 100,000 to get to the, to, the real, to the real UID or the real Git. So far, so simple. Privileged containers run as root, use no user mapping. Unprivileged containers run as non-root and do use user mapping. Here's where it gets complicated you may see something about um, 
unprivileged containers running as privileged users. Does that sound confusing? It confuses the hell out of me. Um, it is something, it is, it is terminology that the LexD developers, LexD is, is, is basically hypervisor, not a hypervisor manager, uh, uh, a management facility on top of LexC. And they came up with this grand idea of, um, okay, we're just going to, def we're, the only thing that we're going to allow henceforth is that every container runs as root, but some of them still use UID and Git mapping. Okay? And that's confusing. I just want to point it out and acknowledge that it's confusing. We're not going to care about it any further for the rest of this tutorial because number one, we're not going to be using LexD. And number two, all of the containers that I'm going to show you how to run or that I'm going to be demoing here, they are all unprivileged and they do use UID and Git mapping as you would generally expect. Do we have another? Um, well, the laptop has, what do you mean, the mic? Yeah. I can totally mute the mic. Just in case. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me know if that's better. Sure. Okay. Are we roughly on the same page about, like, what, what's a container in the first place? Uh, what's, a, what's a system container? What's an application container? What's a privileged container? What's an unprivileged container? Does that roundabout make sense? Perfect. Okay. So then we're coming to the very important question of, why would you want to do this? Like, why would you want to run a containerized desktop? Or why would you be running things in containers on your desktop? And I'll give you my reasons for why I'm doing this. Reason number one, I want to keep my root file system lean. Um, I'd like to have as few packages installed in my root file system as I possibly can. Now, granted, that is still quite a few. This laptop, as it stands here right now, that's an Ubuntu 16.04 system, which literally only uh, contains in packages the stuff that I use on a daily basis, that still amounts to about 2,000 Debian packages that are installed there. You know, there's a bunch of library packages in there and so forth, but it's still a fairly substantial number. But it would, it would be far more if I weren't using containers. Um, all of those packages, of course, need to be updated and patched, which I tend to do quite religiously, and the fewer there are, the faster my daily updates get. Simple. Also, what is not installed can't launch a background service. And uh, so that means I, that is, that is a, a potential you know, vulnerability or issue that I'm not opening myself up to. Um, and also a service that doesn't run, doesn't consume cycles, and thus doesn't use power, and there's a bunch of, um, of interesting uh, advantages of that. So that's one thing. I'd like to keep my root file system lean. I want to run multiple parallel versions of a lot of packages. Um, I frequently need to install multiple packaged versions of some software on my laptop. And my personal prime example is I tend to work a lot with OpenStack, so OpenStack client libraries. Um, it's relatively routine for me to use two to three sets of OpenStack clients for different OpenStack versions in parallel for testing. Um, one would, for example, be the Ubuntu packages for the latest release and one with the packages for the release prior and then maybe uh, one with the packages to ship in the default install of the distro and maybe even another where I install Python packages with pip install or something like that. Um, but the important thing is that I want to be able to run and simulate multiple different versions of packaged software that I want to be able to install in parallel on my system. Thirdly, I want to spin up and throw away things easily. I'd like to be able to, when um, I've stuffed something up um, in, for example, my OpenStack client environment, I just like to be able to throw all of that away and actually know that yes, none of it is left and um, I would then like to respin it relatively quickly. Um, you know, obviously if we're, if we're only talking about stuff like Debian packages, getting rid of something that you've installed is relatively reliable with apt remove dash dash purge, but there's a bunch of other stuff. You know, there, there are things like, um, uh, Python packages installed from PyPy or, uh, or NPM modules or what have you, right? I just like to be able to put that in a can and when I no longer need it, I'd like to throw it away and get a new can, essentially. Fourthly, and this is something that, that Jesse mentioned in the keynote this morning as well, um, I'd like to keep my root file system clean of anything that is not free and open source software, um, which on the one hand, I inherently don't trust 
Uh, number two, they usually have relatively crappy packaging policies, right? So things like Skype, running Skype in a container is something that I completely do not consider outrageous. Um, that is something that I do as well. Uh, my company tends to use or tends to prefer Zoom for video conferencing and that's another non-free client and I'd like to have that in a container as well. Um, I go so far as to not allow non-free fonts on my, on my file system but only in a container. So um, if someone actually wants me to, in, to use like Arial which is something that Ubuntu I can install via the MS TTF core font installer or whatever it's called. Um, I actually create a separate container with those fonts in it and LibreOffice and then I run the LibreOffice that needs those fonts from within the container. Hooking in with that, hooking in with the, with the um, proprietary licensed software like Skype or Zoom or whatever, uh, which like I said, I inherently trust less than open source software. I also want to be able to do selective device pass through. So I'd like to be able to decide which one of my webcam devices, Skype or Zoom, should actually see. Right? I want to, and I want to selectively put that in. Um, and now with containers, I can do that relatively nicely. Another thing that was mentioned in the keynote uh, today, containers basically get a fake proc and dev and sys tree, so they don't see that information from the host unless I explicitly enable that. And then I can pass in, for example, just one of my webcam devices and make only that available to a specific container. Just as a disclaimer, I am certainly not saying that that solves all of that software security problems, right? Um, it just strikes me as a better idea to have this compartmentalization than not to have it is all, right? I, it just contributes to that. And then finally, on the why question, why am I doing this with Lexi? Um, and why am I not doing it with a different container runtime or management facility? Like, um, why am I not doing it with LexD? Why am I not doing it with Docker? Why am, I, why am I not using virtualization like KVM, et cetera? Um, just to, to, um, to point those out, um, LexD, like I said, to the best of my knowledge, doesn't expose the option of having the container process run as non-root in the host, and I'd like to have that. Um, Docker is really not built for system containers and geared towards sort of the application container category. Um, I, of course, could run applications Dockerized and that is something that developers, application developers tend to like a lot, but that's frequently not what my testing scenario is. I'm not an application developer, I'm a system integrator, so I need to know how an application behaves within a specific environment. If that specific environment happens to be, shall we say, CentOS or Ubuntu or whatever, what I really want to test this application in is a Ubuntu or CentOS or whatever container. Uh, KVM is simply too heavyweight for, for what I need to do, right? I don't need full hardware emulation. Um, um, I want sharing parts of my host file system to be relatively simple and easy. Um, and also none of the work that I do is typically kernel related. So the fact that a container only gives me one kernel to work with and not a choice of kernels is immaterial to me. So that's why I really don't need something like, like KVM. And when I do, when I have that testing need, well, we happen to run a public OpenStack cloud and I can just make basically an OpenStack API call and boom, I have a VM, so that's why I don't need that uh, on my laptop. Okay, so that much for sort of the theory and the motivation and what have you. Now, for those of you who want to follow along with the next steps that I'm going through, um, all of the information that is contained in this tutorial is uh, on GitHub. If you go to github.com, FG Haas, there is a repository called LCA 2018 LXC. And uh, there is a readme in there that uh, is, a, uh, is a more or less a sort of a command cheat sheet. Um, and everything else, all the other resources um, that are in here, that are mentioned in here, um, are there as well. As you, could, uh, as you could glean from the talk or tutorial description in the schedule, um, the assumption here is that you do have Lexi installed on your system and um, the, the, what I'm showing here, the examples that I'm showing here, do assume that you're running on Ubuntu. Uh, on everything else, the general concepts that I'm explaining to you should also work. Your mileage may vary. And uh, later on, we're also going to get to uh, some slightly more advanced use uh, where we are using Ansible 
So um, if you want to follow along for the whole thing, then uh, you might want to install on Ubuntu the Lexi package, which installs a bunch of dependencies, and, um, the, and the Ansible package. And ideally, you should make sure that you're installing Ansible 2.4, which is the latest Ansible release, and that is available from the Ansible PPA. So uh, add APT repository, PPA colon Ansible slash Ansible. Right? Um, like I said, this was in the, in the, in the description. Uh, so if you already have that, great. Um, if you do not, it should take no more than a couple of minutes to set that stuff up. And um, I will now give you about two minutes or so to, for, for those of you who do want to clone this, to do that uh, before I continue with my first example. Yes? Is, does anyone have power? Because power? Oh, I do not know. Does power work for other? Here it works? Do you want to move over here? Maybe these work? There's also, there's one more seat left down there. Whatever, wherever you feel most comfortable. Give me a thumbs up if you're good to go. All right. Yes, please. Uh, a bit unrelated, but how do we make our slides change the same time as yours? <laughs> um, okay, so the question was, uh, for those of you who uh, opened up the QR code earlier and, um, uh, and are following the slides, by the way, sorry, I should have mentioned that. I, I, I do that routinely uh, for people with, um, with vision issues uh, for people who, who uh, more easily follow along on their own laptop or on a, on a tablet or anything. Um, so um, if you open the URL that I gave earlier uh, to follow my slides along, uh, those will advance in sync with how I advance my slides here. And uh, that is a feature, it's called uh, multiplex of uh, reveal.js. And if you're interested in how that works, I have a repo on GitHub in my repository. It's just called Presentation Template. And uh, that is sort of a showcase of like all of the stuff that I use and what have you. And um, that's apparently relatively simple and easy to use because um, if you were in Tim Sarong's talk yesterday, he used that too and he got going with it in a couple of days. So apparently that's okay. That's reasonably useful. Um, and if you have any other questions on that, please see me after. I'll be more than happy to geek out about that. Um, and Reveal.js is generally fantastic. I find it an absolutely wonderful way to do, to, to author presentations and do slides and present from them. Okay, has everyone copied down the URL that wanted to? I think so, right? No one's screaming? Good. Okay, we're gonna start out with a really, really simple example. Uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things that I'd like to do is I'd like to keep my uh, root file system relatively uncluttered of like various libraries and runtimes and so forth. And one such example that I really don't need in my host is a full Ruby runtime. I don't do any development in Ruby. I don't use any tools uh, basically that use Ruby. Um, and the, really the only Ruby application that I use a lot is SAS. Right, because that's how I write my style sheets. So what I do is I keep Ruby SAS and the entire Ruby runtime constrained to a container and I only spin it up when I need it and um, that's when I update things and what have you and otherwise it's just not there. So what I wanna do is I wanna create a container and that container should um, include just enough for me running Ruby SAS. That's all. Okay. 
So let's cut to the chase. Let's see what we do here. Is that reasonably visible for everyone sitting at the, at the various tables? OK, cool. So, um, and um, the, that information, basically on how to do the next steps, that is all here in the, in the readme, right? In the readme of that, um, of that directory. I'm sorry, of that repository. And uh, we're going to get started Doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, with this obviously has already been done uh, on my system. But uh, for you, that will still be important. You're going to have to um, do two things, basically, after you, after you install your Lexi to make these unprivileged containers work, uh, which is, one, you have to tell Lexi that uh, a specific user is allowed to create um, container network interfaces, and you have to tell your host, your kernel specifically, that um, a specific user is allowed to use um, um, UID and Git mapping, right? Um, All right, so let's see. So here's my readme. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to, you want your Etsy Lexi, Lexi usernet to look like this. Okay, so the, the syntax for that is username, white space, type, white space, a bridge name, and the number of interfaces that you're allowed to spin up. Okay, and my username is Florian. Um, the type should be VF. The bridge is called Lexi Bridge Zero uh, on a standard. This is an Ubuntu 1604 system, but it should also that should be the case on a on a on a 1704 box or even a 1710 box as well. And uh, I'm just allowing myself a hundred a uh, hundred interfaces. And there's a little script in here in the README for you uh, if you want to do that. So um, that looks like this, right? You do a sudo t-a to etsy lexi lexi usernet, and then enter your username, vs lexbridge100, and then that's that. Okay. By the way, um, I do understand it is the, the, the last day and the last afternoon of the conference. I know many of you are probably quite tired. Um, it is perfectly okay if you just want to listen. Uh, you can totally do that. You don't have to follow along with every exercise either. All of the information uh, is available on GitHub. Everything that is related to this tutorial is up on GitHub and um, it is all CC by SA licensed and it will be available, well, until whenever I actually shut my GitHub account down. Okay, so uh, for all intents and purposes, that's pretty much indefinite, uh, at least during my lifetime. Okay. Um, the same the same thing is 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 true for if you happen to get stuck here at some point. Um, just if I if I can make a recommendation, just kick back, relax, listen, and come back to it when you're when you're in, back at home or in your office or anything like that. Okay. First thing, let's use it. And uh, the next thing is uh, we want to. Well, actually, no, we don't need to do that yet. And we'll get to that in a second. Well, actually, let's do it now. It's probably better to do it right now. I'm just going to VI this. It's always good to do presentations from VI. All right. Let's see. This one right here, right? Uh, uh, user sub UID and sub git mapping. Um, there is a file uh, in your file system that's called, or two files actually, they're called etsy sub UID or an etsy sub gid. And uh, there you define uh, what sub UID and what sub gid range you allow for specific users. And what that syntax means is uh, for your username, uh, create 65,535 possible UID and git mappings that are all shifted by 100,000. So 
that means that um, whatever, for example, UID 3200 in your container becomes uh, 103,200 in your host. That's just how that goes. And that is considered a sub git and sub UID for the host. Sorry? Yeah, so the syntax, the syntax uh, user, whoa, the syntax username 100,065,535 000, means that uh, the user is allowed to map a total of 6,535 UIDs and GIDs that are all shifted by 100,000 um, from, the, from the container to the host. And there is also a nice little script for that. If you want to do that, there we go. Like this, pseudo, oops, sorry, you, you're not, ah, wait, we've got a problem with the screen here a little bit. Um, hang on, uh, do the readme again. Where were we? Right here. For F in Etsy sub UID sub GUID, uh, sub UID sub GID, do sudo TA dollar F and then this happens. Yes, please. Um, my user account is already in Etsy as far as the different numbers. Are they delimited or should I be saving them to the Let me see that really quickly. So the question was what do you do if, if your user is already in there? What do you got here? Uh, what if another user is already in there? What uses the uses the same range? Um, well, then either you um, you use like a different range, um, and then you basically adjust like when I get to the next steps, um, or you temporarily change it. Right, it's basically up to you. No, no, two users can't occupy the same range. There we go. Okay. Um, now, first thing we're going to do, and I'm going to get back into my readme here. First thing we're going to do is we are going to create, and you're going to see this here in this line, and I do encourage you to like look in, uh, in your own environment rather than like follow me along here on the, on the, on the projected screen um, because that get, tends to get cut off. Um, we're going to create our first, uh, our first container, and uh, we're going to call that um, Xenial SAS uh, because it's going to be based on Ubuntu Xenial, Ubuntu 16.04. Uh, the Lexi create command, lo and behold, creates a new Lexi container. Uh, we have to give it a name, that is Xenial SAS. We have to set a template, that's what the dash T stands for. Um, if you're curious, um, there is a directory that's called user share Lexi templates, if I remember correctly, where all these templates are. They're basically just scripts um, that pull, pull down uh, either an image or, or, or bootstrap a container uh, for you from packages. In this case, we're using the Ubuntu cloud image, so that is um, um, basically a tarball that we're pulling down from cloudimages.ubuntu.com. And uh, we have to provide a couple of command line uh, utilities or command line, uh, I'm sorry, command line arguments for the template itself. And that's why you have the, after the Lexi create and Xenial SAS T Ubuntu Cloud, you have the dash dash. Because then what follows are the uh, arguments that you pass to the template script, right? And the template script, the Ubuntu Cloud template script, we have to tell, we want to install from the release Xenial. 
and we want to install from the tarball at cloudimagesubuntu.com slash xenial current xenial server cloud image blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Um, so um, thankfully we're like behind really, really fat pipes here, so downloading this image shouldn't take forever for you. For me, it's gonna be even faster because on my system, it's already been downloaded before, and so it's been cached, right? So Lexi Create is smart enough that when it pulls down a template like that, it puts it in a little cache, and um, if you want to spin up another container from that same template, then um, off you go with the cached copy. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna take this uh, the stuff that is that is right in there, the Lexi create command. And we're going to fire that off. Oops, that was the wrong one. Oh, come on. Do that again. Where were we here? So that's that. Um, like that's super quick because it's already cached, right? So it does a wget normally and then it pulls that down and then it extracts the container file system and that's it, right? Here's our container. Yes, please. Uh, tell me what kind of error you have and then I can tell you if I can fix it right now or later on. I will be more than happy to look into that later if that's okay with you. All right, so that happens when um, you, so what you saw there is, uh, is actually a missing package. Um, and let me look the name up for you. So hang on one second. Um, to go to something else here. I think it's uh, PAM CGFS, but let me, let me look here real quick. Um, getting ahead of myself here, but that is okay. Uh, rooms. Oops. Okay, check if you have the Lexi, UID map, and libpam CGFS tools, uh, libpam CGFS packages installed. Um, and if any of those are not installed, then you're gonna have to install them and log out and log back in. Hello? They're right there. They're right on the screen right now. Lexi, UID map, and libpam CGFS. Sorry? Say again? Packages. That's a, that's okay. So you the you just have a list here of those of those packages um, in that YAML. What you want to do is you want to do an apt install of Lexi that should already be there. But you also you'd also do an, an uh, apt get install of UID map, uh, libpam cgfs, and squashfs uh, squashfs tools. So if you just installed those packages, you do need to log off once and then log back in, because otherwise PAM doesn't pick up those settings.
So let's do this. So if all else fails for you, then uh, um, if, even if the unprivileged containers don't work for you, the privileged ones still should, okay? In which case, your, and I'll be happy to accommodate that in the rest of the tutorial, uh, in which case your config files will go somewhere else than with the unprivileged ones, but I'll be happy to mention that, right? So if the thing that gets you going for now, the fastest, is actually just prefixing everything with sudo and actually run privileged containers, then we can totally do that, right? That is, uh, and, and we, can, we can get back to, um, to the unprivileged ones later on. And essentially, it's entirely up to you whether you want to go through the, the whether you want to jump through the hoops in order to uh, make unprivileged containers work, uh, or whether you just want to sudo things for now. Does that work for you, by the way? If you sudo it and run it, okay, cool. Um, I mean, I can give you this for. Um, I can give you a little bit of a comparison here like what this does differently, okay? So for those of you who are now contemplating, am I gonna be running this unprivileged or privileged? The difference is that follows, <coughs> sorry, is as follows. Um, if you run, if you create an unprivileged container, so one that runs as your own user, then uh, this kind of stuff is going to live in dot local in your home directory, slash share, slash like C. Okay, and that's where your unprivileged containers go. As you can see, I run a few on my desktop, right? Um, if you are running priv privileged containers, so containers that run as root, those will go to varlib like C, which is not readable by a regular user. And as you can see, I have a couple of privileged containers running in my environment as well. Those are the two default um, paths. If you're running a privileged container, those live in varlib like C. If you are running an unprivileged container, uh, those live in your home directory under a dash, a dot local share uh, like C. And if you create a container named Xenial SAS that uh, where you where you prefix the Lexi create with sudo, what you would see is a um, is a path uh, var lib Lexi slash Xenial SAS, and that's that, right? And in my case, that does happen to be in local share Lexi, and here is a Xenial SAS. Like this, oops, sorry, not ls, but cd, there we go. And that, uh, that contains uh, a file name config, that's your container configuration, and it contains the root fs, so basically that is your container root. And what you find in there, if you cd into that, you're gonna see just a regular old Ubuntu installation. And um, wherever you've spun up your, your uh, Lexi container, whether you've spun it up as root in varlib Lexi, or whether you've spun it up in local share Lexi, um, you can take a look at your config file. I actually should show you one of my unprivileged ones. Because I have a few default configurations here. Oops. Hang on a second. You have to install? That's cloud img dash utils, right? Okay, all right. So for those of you running into that uh, weird little error on whatever the Ubuntu version is that you're running, uh, cloud, image, cloud image utils is the package that you install to make it work, perfect. Okay, cool. Cloud image utils, fair enough. All right. 
Here we go. Okay, so as you can see, the, the, the thing that has been created here, um, you get a root FS, you get a, you get a network configuration, etc., etc. I'm not going to go into too many of the details um, of of these things here right now. Um, there are there's an awful lot of things that you can that you can configure in Lexi, and with the next few containers that I'm going to show you, we're going to scratch the surface of that a little bit, um, but I'm not going to go into uh, every detail of every configuration option. Uh, for now. Um, we can simply attach, we can start the container, right? It's email SAS, like that. We can attach to it. This is an unprivileged container. This is now running as my own user, but if I drop into it, if I do Alexi attach, whoops, I'm root, and then I can do anything that I want um, in that thing. Just to demonstrate what the, what the uh, container separation does for us, uh, I could, for example, do a PS, uh, oops, PS like that, right? And you see there's only a handful of processes um, that are actually running there. I probably piped that through less so you, it's in, you, you, can, you can see it more easily on the, um, on the screens here where things do get cut off a little bit. Um, so that is overall, that is a handful of, like just 23 total processes that are running in this container and obviously the host is running way more. So that's just your demonstration there of, a, of, the, of the PID namespace. Um, you also see, if you look at, uh, into this thing, uh, that we have a, let's do this here really quickly, right? Um, we do have a PID1 there, it's right at the very top. Um, so that, that's what makes it a system container. We have a, a regular SPIN init as our PID1 and that happens to be a system D and then everything else, um, those are then children of our, of our system management daemon. And as you can see, there's a cron running there and RSYS log and at D and SSHD and so on. Question. Yes, please. Is this something like Docker Hub that I can just click on? I'm, I'm sorry, say again. No, 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 hang on, hang on, no, 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 like what you pull down, the question was is there something like Docker Hub? What you pull down from, from, from Docker is an image, yeah. uh, an image for an entire application. Uh, the, the, the equivalent to that is, is basically your, your Lexi create command where you specify what template we're running from and then where you're, where by, with your, with your uh, command line options for the template script, um, you tell it what actual image it is that you want to download. Is there a repository for templates? Yes, the, uh, well, it's actually part of the distro. It's part of the Lexi distro. Uh, it ships with a bunch of templates. It ships with a template for Ubuntu, it ships with a, a template for Debian, OpenSUSE, Fedora, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, definitely, that, that does exist. And of course, you can write your own template script, right? You can write your own download script. Okay, um, I wanna move on here um, um, a little bit. Um, and uh, like I said, um, everything that is uh, that is in here is uh, is available online. So uh, let's do a few interesting things uh, with this with this container of ours. Um, for example, one of the things that I might want to do is I might want to share my host's home directory or any other file system path uh, with the container. So uh, maybe what I'd like to have is um, a file system mount. And in my case, like I said, frequently what I want to do is I actually want to share my home directory. Um, what that helps me do, obviously, is I can then, like once that is in place, I can, um, I can drop into a container, be myself, so be my own user, and then access my files in my home directory um, as if I were outside a container, except that I have all these other binaries available that are only in this container, such as, for example, SAS from Ruby. Now, if I want to be able to do that, then there's a few conditions that I need to meet. 
besides the SAS binary being available in the, in the container. And I don't have a, an, an interactive lab of sorts for this, but I'll be more than happy to show you um, what that looks like. What do we need to do then is uh, we need to be, we need to make sure that um, my username, my personal username that happens to be Florian, um, must map to a user that is available in the container. So in other words, um, we, uh, I, I have to be able to start a process under my own UID and Git. Um, my home directory must be available inside the container and not only must it be available, but it must actually be writable um, in that container. Okay, so let's see how we can do that. I'm gonna drop out of the container here and we're gonna have a quick look at some details in the configuration. How do I do this, right? And there are two things that are reasonably important here. So one is the ID map. And this is a neat little trick that you can play on like C. This is, uh, interestingly, it's relatively underdocumented. There's basically one obscure blog post that you can find that explains this. And the syntax here is a little bit arcane. Um, let me explain the, what, uh, what the ID map um, what these ID map entries mean. So, uh, let's see, can I highlight this so that you can see it? Uh, it's not great, but I guess you can see where the pointer is or where the cursor is. Um, you see an ID map entry in here, and it has the relatively cryptic syntax of U, 0, 100,000, 1,000. What that means is that for user IDs, and that's what the U stands for, from zero to, f starting from zero, map a total of 1,000 UIDs such that they are shifted by 100,000, right? Let me say that again, because it sounds weird and it's complicated. Starting with user ID zero, that is root, map 1,000 user IDs, that is to say UIDs zero to 999, uh, shifting them by 100,000. So that means that what is UID zero, that is root in the guest, becomes UID 100,000 in the host. Okay, and allow that for a total of 1,000 UIDs. Also allow the same thing for, a for the same number uh, of GIDs. That's the next one, right? That's this thing. And then, and then create a user mapping of or a UID mapping of the UID 1000, that happens to be my user Florian, and map it to the user 1000 in the guest, or I'm sorry, in the container, right? In other words, map everything, but pass through user ID and git 1000, right? So everything else should be mapped, but my own user ID should be the same. And then there's one other thing that I need to do which is I have to tell it what my hang on. Oops, sorry I have to say, I want to also add a mount. I want to create a mount entry. I use Lexi mount entry for that. And I want to mount home to home. There's no leading slash in here, that's intentional. add two more options to that, like this. Okay, like C-mount entry, home home, and R bind. I'm sorry? Yeah, it's a, it, well, yeah, it's a file system type. It's, it basically is, is, uh, is uh, a standard FS tap syntax without dump and pass, right? So,
Okay, so now if I have that, if I have these ID maps that you see at the top, and I have this mount entry, I can quickly stop that container. Actually, let me, let me keep that up for you for a little bit, right, for that mount entry. By the way, if you were using, if you were using sudo earlier, just forget the ID maps and, uh, and just, create the, just create the mount entry one because unprivileged containers don't do any ID mapping. Uh, I'm sorry, privileged containers don't do any ID mapping. The last two ID map rows? Yeah. Um, so in the first two, we, we tell it to map everything from zero to 999 and shift. Then we say map 1,000, but only one item, and then shift everything else beyond that. Right. So 1,001 and following that gets shifted again, right? So, okay. So now that I have that, now that I've included that Lexi mount entry, that's also in the readme. So I can do Alexi stop of my Xenial SAS. And then I can restart it. There we go. And if I now were to do Alexi attach to this thing, Xenial SAS. And now within this thing, I go to my home. Then there's a bunch of directories in there that actually come from my home on the host. So the user Florian then actually finds a home Florian directory that's in there. Uh, the other stuff that you see there, by the way, is EcryptFS, and you totally should be using EcryptFS for your, um, for your home directory. Okay, cool. So that allows us to do that sort of thing. Now, I want to show you a few other things that are possible with a Lexi configuration like this. Um, and I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to just show them to you um, because really you shouldn't be doing these things manually and I have a better way of doing things to show you afterward. But I'm going to still show you these, uh, these configuration options. So, one of the things that you might want to do is, because, oh, well, I should maybe prove to you that here within this thing, I can now do an apt install Ruby SAS, and the other thing's called Ruby I notify, I think. I uh, no, and Ruby notify is what it's called. Oops. Hang on. Um, have you started uh, the Lexi Usernet daemon? That would start on system boot, but uh, if you've just installed Lexi, then that wouldn't have been started yet. Oops. Here we go. So that's a bunch of stuff, right? I, I only want to install Ruby SAS and Ruby Notify, but there is a whole load of stuff that comes with it. And that's the primary reason why I really want to run this thing in a container rather than have, like installing it and then when I no longer need it, throw all of these things away and then hope that apt get auto remove does the right thing for me, right? Um, I'd much rather just be able to just toss the container and start over. But if I do this, this thing all gets installed. Da -da 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 -da, right? And that's literally just to compile SAS into CSS. Right? That's just so I can do SAS dash dash watch. That's all, right? So those are a bunch of things that come in there. Right? And no, I do not know why for Ruby SAS I actually need to install Wayland. I prefer not to know. Right? <laughs> It then, like, once this is done, it, it does what, it, what, it's, what it's supposed to do, and that's that. Okay. So, I'm not going to watch this complete here, um, but I can, I can show you later on that, yes, in fact, we can totally then start SAS, and, uh, and we're happy. But now, let's start thinking about a few more interesting things. 
Uh, because ultimately, you know, Ruby SAS, that's just a command line application. That's not a whole lot of, that's not very, very interesting um, that we're doing. Yes? Uh, if I sp well, if I spin up another machine and I install packages in it, then yes, of course, that's going to take the time of installing the packages. And yes, you can do something smart, which I do here uh, on my laptop uh, on my laptop routinely, which is uh, I run at, um, apt cache or ng um, on the host, and then uh, all of my containers uh, are configured to use that as their apt proxy. And then so the package install is a lot quicker that way. Uh, however, we can do something that speeds up uh, the creation of fully installed containers even further, but let me get to that in a second. So the next thing that I want to talk about is X applications, right? Um, we'd like to turn it up at least sort of a small notch. Uh, we'd like to run an X application in a container. Now, um, so that's not that difficult at all with, with Xorg, which is what I use here. This is Ubuntu 16.04. Um, this approach works for Wayland as well, um, as long as Wayland runs the X compatibility server that's called X Wayland. Um, as for native Wayland, I'm sure there is a way to make this work too. I just haven't looked into it yet. If there's a Wayland developer that happens to be here and would like to read me, in, uh, re read me into that, I'll be more than happy to listen. Now, of course, uh, we, can, we could make an X application available in a container by simply running um, an SSH server inside the container and then SSH X into it, right? Um, and then do X forwarding. Um, but that's kind of boring. And I also, I, I prefer a, a slightly more direct method of, of doing that. So let me show you an example of a pre-installed um, system that I already have. By the way, here's our, oops. There's our SAS, right? So, oops, do a SAS dash dash help, right? So, okay, we can finally do SAS compilation. Great. Um, so let me show you another example, uh, and that is my Xenial Firefox Java thing, right? This is just on, on, on my local box here. And I wanna show you how relatively easy it is to make an application, um, an X application run inside a container. So we do config, and you will see that there are just the relevant entries are these two, the ones at the very bottom, right? You simply uh, bind mount uh, temp.x11unix and dev dri into this thing. One thing that, um, that uh, Lexi allows us to do, it allows us to quote unquote mount individual files into the container. So you don't only get to bind mount directories, but you can pass individual files directly into there. And we do that with devdri, and we do that with the temp x11 Unix directory. And when I do that, that's like literally those are the only changes that I need to make in order to, uh, to run an, an X application. And uh, let's see, if I now start this thing here, there's my Xenial Firefox Java. And uh, now I'm gonna do Lexi attach, Xenial Firefox Java. Um, by the way, the, the reason why I'm doing this, I think is relatively obvious. A Java runtime is another one of those runtimes that I don't necessarily need nor want in my host file system, right? Um, so that's one thing. I don't really want a whole JRE and all the libraries that it comes with in my, in my uh, host file system. And there is another reason, which is I really want to constrain access to my devices um, because there are things like that commonly run as like Java web service application that you then fire up with like Ice-T plugin or Java WS or whatever that, for example, you know, connect to the management console of a server and they are able to like manage virtual media and they have access to my USB and that sort of thing freaks me out if it's a completely like closed source thing that I can't look into. So I'd rather have this thing in a container where I can keep tabs on it. So I've just attached to this thing. Uh, I'm gonna become Florian here really quickly. 
like that. And then I'm going to start Firefox. And, oops. Oh, come on. Nope, that's the wrong one. Out of that. Uh, where is it? There it is, right? So there's my Firefox uh, that's running that right there. And that is now running um, within a container but it has access to my host's X server, right? So that's why I can simply run it in, in, a, in a video, uh, in, a, in, a, in a window here, in a separate window here. Um, and I want to open up, hang on, I want to open up a specific page here. Uh, where we got that? Hang on. Um, so I wanted to open a, a specific website in here, right? This runs in my Firefox in, in a container. Um, and that brings me to the next thing that I now want to try, right? I want to be able to put sound out of my application that runs in a Lexi container. Because when I do this here now, you can probably not hear anything, right? It just pops up and says, hey, to play audio, you might need to load those Pulse Audio libraries, right? And it, it just doesn't work, right? So. Let's see what we can do about um, actually making audio happen. So, hang on. There we go. And let's kill that for a second. Um, so the next thing we really want to do is we want to add some sound to this, right? Um, so sometimes I do want sound coming out of my container. Um, like for example, um, you know, the, 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 the example with the, with, the, with the sound page here is maybe a little bit construed. Uh, but I do need it for, um, you know, running Skype and other things. And uh, there are a couple of ways to do that uh, with Pulse Audio, which I'm running here. Um, I could, for example, I could have uh, a Pulse Audio put its listening socket in a non-standard location and then share that with the container via bind mount. Um, I say non-standard location because this doesn't work with run slash user slash UID, which is where Pulse Audio normally puts that, because if I have systemd running in the container, then that creates its own version of that and mounts over it. Uh, but what I can do is um, I can just start a Pulse Audio TCP socket on my host and then have my applications in the container connect to that instead, right? Let me show you that. Um, so I'm gonna, there we go, I'm going out of this thing here. I don't need to restart it at this point. Uh, I'm just going to do this. I'm gonna do a PACTL load module, module native protocol TCP, which, uh, which loads the, the TCP protocol socket into my Pulse Audio configuration. And then I reattach to this thing, and I become Florian again. And uh, here I simply do an export pulse server equals 10.0.3.1, which is the IP of my host as the container sees it, like this. And then what I want to do is I want to go right back to the page where I just was. Oops, sorry. There was a Google search for this thing. I didn't need to do that. There we go. So there is that thing. And now I need to come out of full screen mode here again. Sorry, this is all a little bit complicated. Doing a demo with uh, two different browsers and 
no confidence monitor. Here we go. So there is that thing, right? We're back. And now let's see. This is an Opus audio file. More specifically, this is an AUG file containing audio encoded with the new Opus audio codec. The standard for the Opus audio codec was recently formally finalized and approved by the Internet Engineering Task Force. It's very standards soothing, body. I think. The Opus codec has been developed from a combination of Skype's Silk codec, which it has used for voice over IP at low to moderate bit rates, and SIF's high quality Kelt codec. Both are designed for low latency, meaning computers can convert raw audio input to encoded audio for transmission very quickly, and then decode it at the other end very quickly as well. This is important for real-time voice chat and other interactive audio, since even 300 milliseconds of latency can make holding a normal conversation almost impossible. Opus combines both human voice optimized silk style encoding from Skype and Kelt mode encoding for music and other audio on the fly in a way that seems to give very... I think that's enough. But so now we learned something about the Opus audio codec as well. Uh, like I said, so this, what that enables you to do is, um, is with, this, with this combination of using uh, the, the, the TCP socket from Pulse Server and just passing in your, uh, your X server, you can run a fully um, X and audio capable application from within a container, which I find reasonably useful uh, because it then enables me to do one other thing. Oh, come on. There we go. Because it then enables me to do one other thing, which is I can then also do a, oops, I can also do a selective pass-through of USB devices. Uh, notably, my camera, my webcam, right? And uh, what I use that for, like I said, my company tends to prefer a proprietary video conferen conferencing system, namely Zoom. And what I then like to do is I like to run my Zoom in a container. It uses the same X settings that, that I just uh, demonstrated for Firefox and the same sound settings that I demonstrated for Firefox. And now the final thing that I need to do is I need to get my webcam into the container. And uh, the way I do that is out of this thing again. Here we go. And there's my Xenial Zoom container like this. And there is a config in here. And here down here is another mount entry, right? And I have two webcams on my laptop. The one that's on board, that's Dev Video Zero, and one that I, that I plug in via USB. Uh, that's the only one that I want to actually be able to use with Zoom. So I do this selective mount entry where I mount dev video one um, into my container, and that's that. And that's the only thing that the container sees out of the host device tree, out of the host dev tree. And then I can be absolutely certain that the only thing that Zoom sees is the webcam that I want it to see. And then, of course, it also uses standard Pulse Audio client library, so what I just described for the audio output also works for the audio input. So this thing sees my microphone and I can, I can just use that and it works really dandy. And when I'm done, um, I don't need to worry about like some background process running in a Zoom system tray icon or any crap like that. I just kill the container and I know there's absolutely nothing from Zoom that's running on my machine anymore. Now, the question that came up from over here earlier is, um, well, if I have to like, keep installing all these packages all the time, isn't there a better way of doing things? Like, can't I have my own little sort of baseline image and then go from there? Well, we totally can. And um, this is built into the Alexi uh, user land binaries, I'm sorry. Uh, but we can really, really cleverly use ButterFS for this thing. Um, we call this cloning. Uh, so cloning or copying a container basically means creating a container not from a template, but basically duplicating the root file system and the configuration of an existing container, then just making a few changes to the con configuration, and so then going from there. So for example, what you might have is you might have a 
um, a local image, a local container that runs Ubuntu Xenial that is configured to your liking. And by config configured to your liking, uh, I mean you might do some things like um, uh, uninstall SnapD, LexD, and open iSCSI, because those install by default in Ubuntu 16.04. Maybe you don't want that, you kick that out, right? Uh, or maybe you want to drop, say, for example, your APT proxy um, configuration into there, or something like that, right? Um, and that's really cool. Uh, the way that we can do that is uh, Lexi create and Lexi copy have an option dash, uh, uh, hyphen capital B for backing store. Um, and if we set that to ButterFS, then um, this thing actually becomes a ButterFS subvolume. And uh, when we then clone this thing, it actually becomes a, um, a, 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 a ButterFS snapshot. Um, so let me demonstrate that for you really briefly here as well. Uh, my containers do run on ButterFS. My var lib C runs on ButterFS and my, my local share lexi runs on ButterFS. Those are symlinks into one ButterFS file system. Um, so just to, just to illustrate like how that works or how quickly that works is I can do this. So I'm timing, uh, I'm creating a container named Xenial Test on a ButterFS subvolume, and I'm creating it from the template. Now, recall that um, the, um, this is, uh, actually already has a, a pre-populated cache, so I don't need to download it, I don't need to download the image from anywhere anymore. Um, and so setting up the entire container takes 10 seconds. Now, this is created from a template, and now I want to clone this thing. I use Lexi copy, and um, I'm doing a time. What? Let me see. Uh, I can get that to you here. There we go. Right. I do a time Lexi copy. It also uses dash b butterfs. Uh, lowercase n means the uh, source that I'm cloning from. So I'm cloning from Xenial test to uh, a name Xenial clone. Right, creating everything from template without downloading anything from the internet on these machines took 10 seconds. Cloning that thing takes 0.3. Okay, so you have a fully functional container that, that contains all of what, it, what was previously installed into a container named Xenial Test, um, and it took you 3 tenths of a second to create it, uh, which is really, really nice. Um, for when you just need to spin stuff up quickly and then throw it away. Okay, so the question was, why do we need, why do we specifically need ButterFS? Because ButterFS is the, is the only true, you know, free and open source file system uh, at this time that uh, fully supports subvolumes and, um, and snapshots. Um, the other option that you can use on uh, Ubuntu 16.04 is, depending on how you're wired, ZFS or ZFS. Um, I'm not very fond of that for a variety of reasons. Um, if you went to Dave Chinner's Teaching an Old Dog New Tricks talk uh, earlier in the conference, it is actually plausible that within, shall we say, one to two years, we might have subvolume and clone cap uh, capability in XFS as well. So at that point, it will no longer be tied to specifically ButterFS. Um, there are two more ways that you can do uh, snapshots and fast clones with Lexi. One is uh, thin provisioned uh, LVM snapshots, and the other one is CephRBD, if you're running your, your Lexi containers off of Ceph clusters. Yes, please. So the question was, um, how does that work without root privileges? Um, you are absolutely correct. For ButterFS, uh, you don't need them to create a subvolume. Um, you do, uh, well, you do normally need root privileges to remove a subvolume, but there is a mount option in, a, in, in ButterFS that allows um, regular users to remove their own subvolumes. And in a Lexi environment, you would typically mount your, your ButterFS with that. 
right? But yes, you're right for, uh, for example, if you're dealing with LVM, then uh, you need root. And if you are dealing with um, Ceph RBD, then you need a user that is able to read the Ceph authentication credentials that are needed to connect to the Ceph cluster. Let me answer you. So the question was, am I running a ButterFS root on my laptop? No, I do not. Um, I run an XFS, I'm sorry, on this machine I run an EXT4 root on my laptop and then everything else is either XFS or ButterFS. Um, if we do this. Um, you will see that there is, a, I, have a, um, I have a thing that I call um, slash SRV slash Lexi. And from there, I have symlinks from var, lib, lexi, and from my local um, home directory, right? So I, I just, I have, I use one ButterFS file system and I use it only for lexi purposes. And um, yeah, that's that. So um, that's it, you know, there's plenty of people who do use ButterFS root on their, on their, on their machines. Okay, and now finally, because I'm almost out of time here, um, I, I did mention earlier that, um, well, we really don't want to do all of this stuff, you know, managing these containers and so forth, um, all manually. And um, I don't, I don't manage my containers manually. Um, I do this uh, from a set of Ansible playbooks. Um, those Ansible playbooks are also up on GitHub if you look into uh, my repository uh, um, on, on, on GitHub, there is, a, there is a thing that's simply called Ansible Laptop, uh, an Ansible Laptop config example, and you're absolutely welcome to look at that, and I'll be more than happy uh, to, to uh, you know, about feedback and, and patches and what have you. Um, but for now, let me just show you what that does. So let's go here, and here is my Ansible laptop, and um, we just created a Xenial SAS and we worked with Xenial Firefox Java, right? So, I'm gonna throw that away. knowing full well that I want it back very, very soon, right? But let's suppose I just stuff something up in these containers and, and I, really, um, I, really don't, uh, I really don't wanna mess with that anymore. So how do I bring them back? Um, and um, I use this Ansible playbook um, for that purpose uh, with an, an, an appropriate configuration. Like I said, it's all up on GitHub. But let me show you what that does. Do this then. Um, actually, let's see if we can do that. Yeah, well, like that. Oops, what was that? So I run an Ansible playbook. I use it with an inventory file from a different directory. Laptop config inventory. Oh, I call that hosts. Um, and um, what do I want to do? I only want to run that on my own machine. I call that Eagle. And, oops, that was the wrong one. I'm sorry. Let me start over. So, Ansible playbook dash i dot dot Ansible laptop config hosts. I want to limit it to my host named Eagle. And I have a tag that's named Lexi, and the playbook name is local.yaml. Um, for those of you not familiar with Ansible playbook syntax, uh, that means that I'm reading my inventory, that is to say my definition which hosts I want to run from a separate directory, where it would also find its host vars and group vars variable that actually configure this thing. Um, I limit it to my local host, which happens to go by the host name of Eagle, and dash t lxc means run only the tasks in this 
um, in, this, in this playbook that are tagged Lexi. And what that does is make sure that all my, my packages that are needed are installed, that the UID and Git maps are correct, that the user net thing is there. And then it creates containers for me and it creates those containers from a basic clone. Um, the clone or the clone source is simply called Xenio. That's my basic, um, my basic Ubuntu installation. And then we create two clones from that, namely Xenio SAS and uh, Xenio Firefox Java which I previously just destroyed, right? And if I now do Alexi info, I'll see that lo and behold, it's back. And now what I wanna do is I want to configure those, right? I actually want to configure those. That too, I can do with Ansible. Um, this may be relatively new to some of you. There is a thing, um, who's familiar with Ansible dynamic inventories? Right, okay, so a dynamic inventory is basically a script that, um, that produces a list of hosts that Ansible can talk to and can also define what is the connection method that we're using to talk to this thing. And um, there is a thing called uh, lexiinventory.py, which I'm ashamed to say is the only thing in this entire presentation that I actually wrote in terms of code. Everything else is just configuration that I wrote. Um, but here's this thing called lexiinventory.py. Ping all. There we go. Tells us that a bunch of our, there's a, uh, I didn't have to tell it like what the lexi containers on the system are. It just talks to the local lexi configuration. Um, and then knows, oh, cool, these are the, these are the, the various Lexi like, containers that are defined here. If I start them now, um, what was that, Xenial SAS? Xenial Firefox Java, there we go. I can do that ping again. And there's two that come back with a pong. Right, so two machines that are, that are now running. And now I can use the very same playbook that I just used. So I wanna do an Ansible playbook. Oops, Ansible laptop config, lexi inventory.py. And now I want to, I don't want to limit it to, oops, inventory.py, there we go. And I don't wanna limit it to anything. Um, I just wanna go local.yaml, whoop. And so it knows all these other containers don't run, but two do run. And then we do a complete Ansible configuration of this thing based on those individual host configurations. As you can see, we toss in, you know, Dbus and Ruby and what have you. This is gonna take a little while. Yes, please. Yes, of course. It's just called Ansible Laptop Config Example. It's also, huh? Really? Let me check on that shortly. I'll do that straight away. Maybe I forgot to, to flip a switch there. Because that's the only thing that I literally just uploaded. Yes, please. No. Okay. Oh, cool. I'll look into that. Awesome. Thank you. Perfect. Self plugs are good. There we go. There's a Firefox. A few fonts that we need there. And then that's the end of that. All right, so thank you for the pointer about the, um, about the config repo. Uh, we'll throw that up shortly. And I am, unfortunately, out of time. But I will say this, um, all of this material is uh, available to you under a Creative Commons uh, attribution share-alike license, CC BY SA 4.0. 
you are perfectly free to share, reuse, and modify this presentation as you see fit. Anything that is useful to you, please go and use it. And then I have a final QR code again for you, which is uh, all of the stuff that I presented here and the README and so forth. Um, that is all on GitHub and you are absolutely welcome uh, to use that. Let me fix that one other thing with that other uh, GitHub repo promptly. And with that, I thank you very much for your time. Do enjoy the conference closing. Everybody get home safely. Uh, happy Australia Day and hope to see you again at LCA as soon as possible. Thank you very much for coming. Have a great afternoon.